Welcome to the Tuesday Night Remix. My name is Dave Warner. I'm the pastor of Engage Newark Church. Glad that you joined us tonight. We would hope that you would participate in this worship service by interacting through the chat messages. Uh, let us know who you are, kind of check in. If you have any prayer requests, let us know that too. We'd love to pray with you. Um, also, there's time in the service for you to respond to things, so it becomes an interactive service for you. Um, we hope that uh, uh, it's, it's something that's important to you to be able to share it as well. Like, if it's meaningful to you, share it. Why not let your friends know that you're, you're, you're worshiping right now on a Tuesday night? So uh, uh, like it, share it, uh, pass it around so other people can participate as well. If God is leading you to give, you can do that at engagenewark.com give. And also, we'd love for you to, to uh, sign up for our texting service so that you can never miss another thing that we do. You can just text the word hello to 740-227-4838. We're so thankful for you to join with us tonight. Tonight might be a little bit of a sensitive topic. Uh, we're talking about money in our series called um, Asking for a Friend. Um, we've had have the question before us, about what, uh, I'll, I'll explain it later in the service, but, but basically how do Christians uh, uh, work with money well. Um, we'll talk more about it here after the singing. But until then, uh, let's worship together, let's pray, and invite God to be in our presence. God, you have invited us to worship with you, and you say in your scriptures, wherever two or three or more gather, that you would be there with us. And so God, we gather here online across who knows what geographical distance, and we are here in your name. So God, we invite your Holy Spirit in our presence, wherever we are, and we ask that you open up your word into our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it Jesus, Jesus, you silence 
How can people hoard money and still call themselves Christians? That was the question that was asked of us in our Engage Asking for a Friend series that we're doing. And I really have no other context for the question except for what I just gave you. So let's clarify a couple things before we get started. First of all, I want to say, what is a Christian? I would ask that person, and if I knew who it was, I would say, what do you mean by Christian? Because there's lots of different ways to take that connotation of Christian. Millions of people call themselves a Christian across the globe, and they've never set foot in a church before. So are they really Christians? You know, some people whose grandma went to church, and and since that person, uh, their grandma went to church, and they were born in a non-Muslim like country or a non-Asian country, they call themselves Christian, because we're a Christian country here in America. And then there's hundreds of thousands of people who are Christian, and they go to church, but they've never really followed what Jesus teaches or what Jesus does. And maybe just, who knows, Jesus might end up saying in the last days, I never knew you. So are they still Christians? I think there's another group of people who trust in Jesus as their Savior and are sincerely trying to live a life uh, like Jesus lived his life and love people like Jesus loved people. And these are Christians. They're people who I call believers. They're not just church people, and they're not just like national cultural Christians. These people are following Jesus, or at least trying to follow Jesus. The other thing I want to clarify is what does it mean to hoard? So if the question is, uh, how can people hoard money and still call themselves a Christian? I want to know, what do they mean by Christian? And then secondly, what do you mean by hoard? Is a savings account hoarding? Is a retirement plan hoarding? It's not really fair to throw out an accusation that anybody who is, uh, have it, has a savings plan or, a, or an investment plan for retirement is hoarding their money, and how could they call themselves a Christian? I don't think that's fair at all, and I would never even address that. I wouldn't give it the time of day except to say Proverbs is full of scriptures that tell us how to avoid poverty, and a lot of that is by saving and investing, working hard, to gain money. John Wesley said, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. I think when you you really go through that and think about what that means in your mind, it's a great principle. Have enough money to save and be generous. Do what you can to, to, to earn money so that you have a balance of what you save and what you can give. I think it's good so you save so that you're not winding up in poverty, and you're giving so that others are not winding up in poverty. Tonight we're going to talk about a story in the Bible about generosity and what it means to be generous um, when you have money and when you don't have money. The church we're going to talk about, they had money, but they weren't generous. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'll give you a little background on the story. So Jerusalem was the birthplace of Christianity. Um, That's where Jesus did a lot of primary ministry and uh, uh, the disciples were gathered there when Jesus was crucified and buried and resurrected. And, and so that's where the church started. The early church came. And so, so at that point, you can actually read in Acts chapter 4 that the early Christians there were, were selling everything that they had and giving to all who had need. It's not too many years later that a famine actually comes and, and kind of wipes out Jerusalem. And so the church is actually really hurting. Um, they're really struggling financially. They have nothing with which to live on, and they're in a lot of trouble. So they get this idea to have the churches from all over around the Mediterranean Sea, all the new places that that were out and beyond Jerusalem, to start donating money together. They would gather money together and then distribute that to the Jerusalem church. And tons of churches commit to do this to help out the struggling church in Jerusalem. And we still do those things today, actually. Our church engaged in York Church just last year gave $10,000 to a church in Haiti so they could put a roof on their building. I mean, that, that's something that we continue to do thousands of years later. So Paul tells them, the Paul, Apostle Paul, who wrote uh, Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and many other books in the New Testament, he tells all these churches, start collecting the money, and over the course of the next year, you'll have a good savings plan so that when Paul returns and he comes to visit them, he can pick up their money, and they could even send a representative with him, and they'll go back to Jerusalem and give the money to the church. But there's this church in Corinth, and that's where the story comes from that we're talking about today. Corinth is a very wealthy city. It's a seaport town. Um, There's money flowing in and out of that town all the time, and they had money. And they had committed to raise money and send it to Jerusalem 
But at this point, where we're going to pick up the story, they hadn't, they hadn't really started yet. They kind of started, but they didn't finish the job. So Paul was on his way to come and get their gift. He knows that they're not going to be ready for him, so he sends a letter ahead of time. He writes them this letter that we're going to read tonight, um, so that upon his arrival, uh, he can collect that money. Now, if you've ever been in the church before and you've heard sermons about money, um, think through the ways pastors have talked about money before. Think of all the different things that, that Paul could have said here to this church that wasn't giving money well. He, he could blast them, he could be angry with them, he could make them feel guilty, he could do all kinds of things. But, but I want you to look at what Paul decides to do here to encourage the Corinthians in their generosity. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to start at verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So of all the things he could do, Paul decides to start telling them a story. And he tells them a story about the churches of Macedonia. Now, Macedonia was an area of, of the country that was a good bit north of Corinth. And they had nothing. Um, when the Romans came and, and took over the Greek Empire, uh, they wiped out the Macedonians because that's where a lot of their strength was at that time. Uh, so, so they were down to nothing, even hundreds of years later. And there's four key differences that, that Paul highlights in this quick beginning of the, of the passage. The first of all uh, is that, that the Macedonian churches were under severe test of affliction. Right? So they, they were persecuted. They, they were struggling. They had a severe test of affliction. Right? The second thing is they had an abundance of joy. Now the Corinthians had no joy. Um, Paul talks about that in other parts of his letters to the Corinthians. The third thing is extreme poverty. The Macedonians had nothing. They had no money. They had no means for themselves. But yet the Corinthians had plenty of money. And then finally, wealth and generosity. They were wealthy in terms of their giving, and their generosity made them wealthy. They didn't have money according to worldly standards, but they were able to be generous with it. And in God's economics, that equates to wealth. So draw the comparison. Corinth is wealthy, they hadn't given anything. Macedonia is poor, and they gave in great generosity. The ones who had nothing gave out of the abundance of what God had given them. And those who had plenty actually hoarded to themselves and they operated out of scarcity. The ones who had nothing were seen as wealthy. The ones who had everything were at risk of being in poverty in God's economy. I want to look at one thing pretty closely here because this word comes up over and over and over in the passage. Verse 1, Paul calls the gift of the Macedonians uh, as grace. He uses the word grace. Now, the word grace in Greek is charis. C-H-A-R-I-S, charis, which usually we say it means unmerited favor. Like, you, you don't deserve it, you don't earn it, you can't get it, uh, uh, get it on your own. It's just given to you. It's a free gift. It's like when Christmas works well, you just are given a gift. That's grace. It's not, not like, I give you a gift if you give me a gift. That's not grace. That, that's not charis. Paul calls it charis, an unmerited favor, a gift, for the privilege of giving to the Jerusalem church. Can you imagine of thinking of giving that way? Like, wow, you mean I can just open up my wallet and just give you uh, people I don't know, anybody, anything, I don't know you, but yet it's a privilege for me to give to you. Um, and that's the way the Macedonians saw it. In their extreme poverty, it was an absolute privilege, it was charis, it was grace, for them to give to the Jerusalem church. Now, verse 3, they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly to receive the gift in relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, to us. So they gave according to their means, and then they gave beyond their means. I think there's something to be said about giving according to your means, but perhaps even beyond your means. Now, I'll, I'll never be one to tell somebody how much they should give. Uh, that's not for me to say. Uh, I think it's highly individualized for every person in every circumstance. But it's clear that even though these people were under extreme pressure 
and poverty and affliction, they still gave very generously. Now, without drawing the comparison comparison between Macedonia and Corinth himself, he leaves it to the Corinthians to determine that they themselves weren't under nearly as much financial pressure as the Macedonians, and yet they had given nothing. Now, we looked at the word grace in the that the beginning there a moment ago in in Charis. And it shows up here again as well. Verse 4, the Macedonians begging us earnestly to receive the Charis in the relief of the saints. It's receiving that gift. They viewed their giving as an act of grace. Being able to give for them was an unmerited favor that God had allowed them to participate in giving this gift. It it wasn't something they felt like they earned or deserved to do. They didn't deserve to give this gift to Jerusalem, but God allowed them to be a part of that. Do you see how special that is? Normally we would think of receiving something as a gift or as grace, as unmerited favor. We've received that. But the Macedonians saw giving as unmerited favor, that this was grace for them. Paul continues to use that phrase. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Now, Titus was the one who was getting the ball rolling for uh, the Corinthian church to raise these funds maybe about a year prior to this. They urged him to finish it. But look, Paul no longer uses the word gift. He doesn't use the word money even. Twice in here he says, act of grace. Finish this act of grace. They had excelled in everything. Knowledge, speech, love. Uh, They were doing really well in all of their discipleship categories except this one thing. See that you excel in this act of grace also. Now, giving generously isn't just a matter of responsibility. It's not a matter of just seeing somebody's need and then taking care of it. It's an act of grace on the part of the giver. Yeah, certainly the receiver receives a gift and, it, and it's grace for them, but on the part of the giver, that's where grace can abound. Verse 8. Paul says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. Now remember, Paul could command them if he wanted to. He started this church. Uh, he could he could say whatever he wanted to say. He could guilt them. He could be angry at them and command them. But he wanted it to be a genuine act of love by the Corinthian church. And so he finishes this passage with another story. Verse 9, For you know by the grace... There's that word again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's the gospel in a a nutshell. Jesus, who had everything, gave it all up to be human. He became poor. He became human. He became a carpenter. He became homeless. He became uh, 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 unjustly accused. He lost all of his friends. He was falsely convicted. He was severely beaten. Ultimately, he was crucified and he was dead. He gave it all up so that in his poverty, we might become rich in him. What an act of grace to us that Jesus would give it all up for our sake that we could experience that gift of grace in our lives, emptying himself so that we could experience the fullness of his riches. Verse 10, And in this matter I give my judgment, this benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also had to desire to do it. Have you ever really wanted to start a project and finish a project, and then like a year later you've only started the project, you've not finished it? Well, that's exactly what happened here with these guys. They they really wanted to do this thing. They desired to do it, and they started it. They just didn't finish it. I think it's important to to recognize that exists within all of us. 
But in verse 11, he says, so now finish doing it as well. He wants them to, to finish what they started so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what a person does not have. So he's saying they have all that they need right there to finish the project. You don't need to go out and do anything more. You have it. It's right there. You just need to finish the job that they started. The same is true for us. I, 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 think, I think it's an important principle here where Paul says it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. We're not accountable to give out of the things that we don't have. He's only saying you're accountable for giving what you have. You don't have to, to go above and beyond like the Macedonians did. You just give with what you have. Verse 13, For I did not mean that others should be eased and you be burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. It is written, Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. And he's like, at some point, they may supply your need when you're in trouble. So you have plenty right now. You have an abundance. Why not send some money to them? It just seems fair. Now, here's a couple thoughts that I have on the passage. And then we'll wrap this up here pretty soon. Giving generously is an act of grace. It's like saying to God, okay, God, I received the grace that you've given me in Jesus Christ, you know, that salvation gift that God has given us. I receive that grace that you've given me through Jesus Christ, and I respond by showing you that I will trust you in a time that I have need or I have lack because I'm going to now give the hard work for like money that I have. I'm going to now give that to you, and it's a resource that's no longer mine. So God, I'm trusting you that as You've given me this grace, now you give me grace in giving. So by giving, we relive the act of grace once again. We're just showing God that we trust in His economics. I don't need to hoard the money, uh, because I trust God will provide for me as I give to Him. At Engage Newark on Sunday mornings, um, we're very intentional about not passing the plate or the basket or the bucket or whatever uh, uh, churches use to gather money, we've chosen very specifically not to do so. Because giving is a response to God's grace in your life, we don't pass the, the plate by somebody to pressure them into responding and thus not experiencing the act of grace for giving. It wouldn't be an act of grace at all if someone was pressured into doing it. So we place bins in the back of the room in such a way that you can respond to worship by giving on your way out. Uh, you leave your gift in, in the bin uh, as you leave the presence of God in response to the grace that God has given you, now an act of grace back to God. Just kind of how we have operated since we've opened in 2018. Um, and, and we're thankful God has provided that for us. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a response to what God has done. Now, now, online, it's a little different scenario. Most of our worshipers are online, and therefore most of our gifts come online. Um, we actually recommend online giving as a matter of discipline. And Before my family did online giving, we would frequently forget to bring the checkbook or not have any cash on hand or whatever. And, and then like a few weeks would go by, and we'd be like, oh, no, we owe a lot of money to the church. And that's not an act of grace anymore. Um, that becomes frustration. So... Now it just goes every week, and uh, we do have the discipline of it. Here's another thing. We don't talk about percentage either. And Paul didn't talk about a percentage gift at all in terms of generosity. Some churches focus on trying to get everybody to a 10% giving, and that's, I think, a fine individual goal for a family. But aside from the Old Testament, some very specific things in the Old Testament, there's not a lot in the New Testament about percentage of, of gift because I think it's rather arbitrary number. It's, it's not a bad goal to shoot for, but think about it. For some people, 10% is a drop in the bucket. It, to, uh, giving 10% to the church means nothing to them, but for other people, it would be very hard to give 10%. That's an extreme amount of money 
out of one's income. We couldn't afford 10% ourselves for a very long time. Uh, actually, I'm not even sure what, where our percentage is at the moment. Um, but we knew we wanted to grow in our giving. So what we chose to do about 10 years ago was each year we would grow by 10%. So in our weekly gift that we gave to the church, at the, at the change of the new year, we grew that gift by 10%. And just this last week, since I'd forgotten it the week before, I changed our gift to reflect that change of the year, and I added 10% in. And because we've built that in over the course of the last 10 years, we're now giving at a level that we couldn't have imagined at, at the beginning. There's, there's no way we could give then what we're able to give now because God has, has allowed us to grow in that gift. It's literally like two and a half times greater per week than what we started with. It's just a matter of growing it. So, so, so starting small is okay. Um, starting with what you have, starting with, with um, your means, knowing and planning ahead. Um, this isn't a, an emotional appeal like open up your wallet and give what you can. No, this is thinking through. This is what God has given me, and now what can I return as an act of grace to God? So you start small. And Paul says that. Start with what you have. Don't give out of what you don't have. Don't go in debt trying to give to the church. Uh, that, that would make no biblical sense whatsoever. And here's the thing. So percentage is not important, but passion is. Your desire, your want to, your level of, of just wanting to be a part of this act of grace, of giving to God, to, to be a part of that community of faithfulness. Passion then leads to persistence. Persistently giving. Maybe even when you're like, oh boy, I don't know if we're going to make it this time if we give this $10 in. Man, I, I, from a human standpoint, I say, I get you. And, and if you were to come talk to me and say, Dave, I can't give this $10 this week, I'd probably be like, well, then don't. Because you don't want to put yourself in, in a poverty position. But, but our faithfulness would lead us to believe that God will provide for us. God will, will, will cover for us. His grace is greater than our, our economics, uh, economical understanding that God will provide for you. He always has for us when we've been in those situations. Every single time. You're, you'll find that when you fully rely on God to provide for you, you will grow in ways that you never understood possible before. So percentage is not as important as passion, and passion leads to persistence in giving generously. So back to the original question. How can a person hoard their money and call themselves Christian? Let me summarize with these words. I think Paul would say, you aren't living in the grace of God if you hoard your money. But can a Christian hoard their money? Uh, let's again think about what Christian means, but take savings and investments out of the hoarding understanding because they, those have biblical foundations. And let's ask this different question. Can a follower of Jesus not give generously? And I'd say the answer is probably not. If you're going to truly follow Jesus and and work on your discipleship, fully turn yourself over to Jesus, then you're also turning your pocketbook over. You're turning your wallet over. You're turning your money over to Him as well. You're saying to God, I trust you completely, even with the possibility of my having a lack because I am now giving to someone else. We're turning that over to Jesus. We're not really fully following Jesus until we turn our entire lives over to Him, and that includes our money. That's where faith grows. That's when it becomes an act of grace. On Sunday morning, we covered a few different topics around this idea, and I even gave our church uh, an outline of our uh, financial responsibilities of 2020 and, and how we were able to grow during the pandemic and things like that. If you would like to be a part of that and, and hear that, you're welcome to go listen to the Sunday morning um, service. Also, I'm going to provide a link for you to so you can see our, our 2020 financial report and uh, can get to know like where we're heading in the next year. So God bless you, and thank you for joining us today. Let's take a moment to pray. God, thank you for, for these moments that we've had together to, to, to open up your word and to... Uh, uh, experience what you might have for us in terms of our discipleship for generosity. 
Help us to have faithfulness to you and trust you that, that uh, you will provide for us even when we find ourselves in a, an area of need or lack and still feel the discipline to give generously. Be with us in these days. In Jesus' name, amen.
for joining in on the Tuesday night remix. We hope this was a blessing to you. We hope also that, that God leads you to find ways to give generously, starting small, uh, uh, growing in it, uh, giving out of your means and not what you don't have, but what, what you can. Be thoughtful and, and be, be honest with yourself about it. Um, continue the conversation on uh, in the chat. And uh, if nothing else, we'll see you next Tuesday right here at the Remix or on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. God bless.